So we're starting unit four today. And unit four is a big unit. It's going to take us all of the last five weeks of the semester here. Unit four is about measurement, geometry, and partly because we had no place else in the course to put it, statistics. Um, realistically, statistics could be a unit all on its own, but didn't really have time for a fifth test in here. And it just, it, we only get time to just lightly touch statistics, so we'll be covering about a week and a half worth of statistics anyways. So today we're going to start the measurement part. And to talk about measurement, we need to talk about where measurement came from. And really, it's the, the easiest to talk about length measurement. And we're going to be starting out talking about the standard measuring system. Now, the standard measuring system is anything but standard. And we'll go over what I mean by that as time goes on here. Um, the standard measuring, standard measuring system is the original measuring system, but it's not, not only is it by standard as in being the same everywhere, it's not the same everywhere. Second, it's not the standard anymore because it's not what everybody uses. Um, the United States right now is the only industrialized nation that still uses the standard measuring system. Um, pretty much every other country uses the metric system. But to understand how measurement developed, it's, it's the place to start. Measurement actually developed from a need to communicate. Uh, if we're both building something and we want to build it the same, and if we're in the same room, it's easy enough. If we want to build something the size of this piece of paper, well, we can just walk over and we can mark it off of each other. But if you're down the hall or across town or somewhere else, I have to find some way to communicate that size of this piece of paper to you. Now, I suppose I could cut a piece of rope or something and that's that size and send it to you, but it'd be really nice if I could, you know, sketch a little picture and label and label several of those lengths at once to send to you. So they started measuring. You know, for example, they might take this pen that I use for writing on the screen and they might say, okay, compared to this piece of paper, there's one, two, two and a half. So I might send a message to you saying, okay, you need to cut a piece that's two and a half pens long. So you take your pen and you go, okay, one, two, two and a half. Well, you got something that's this long. Why did yours come out longer? Well, because if we can compare the two pens, the red pen here is about three quarters of an inch longer than the, the black pen. It's, it's that much longer. So for measurement to work, there had to be two assumptions that had to be true. One is... Whatever I use to measure it with, you have to have one too. Well, I used a pen and you have a pen. So that part was met here. But the second assumption that has to be met is what you have is the same size as what I have. And that was where this one went wrong. The red pen is considerably longer than the black pen. So it didn't work here. We ended up with a miscommunication. So what they ended up using is one, things that pretty much everybody had, and two, they were pretty much the same size from one person to another. For example, in our standard measuring system, what's our smallest unit of length that we use? The inch. The inch actually comes from distance from the end of your thumb to the point of that first knuckle. So if I'm going to measure this, I would go, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now I count up. And pretty much everybody's thumb was close to the same size. Now you got to remember this developed thousands of years ago um, when features were, people were shorter so their features were smaller, less variation from one person to another. And it was, you know, all judgments aside, it was considered a man's thumb, not a woman's thumb. So you didn't have that gender difference in size either. So they were relatively consistent. Um, 
Now, as time went on, King Edward in the 500s declared his thumb was going to be the official inch of the land. So they came in and they cut a little, little blocks of wood the size of his thumb and passed them out for everybody to use. And, of course, all the other measurements he declared were going to be his official measurements of the land as well. And we'll go through those as we, we work our way up here. Unfortunately, well, first of all, King Edward, even though that was a very egotistical move, it was a huge advancement in measurement and how measurement could be done. Um, by standardizing measurement, it allowed us to make a lot of changes. And we'll mention those as we go through. Unfortunately, King Edward wasn't the only one with that same idea. Other countries, other regions, different rulers declared their thumb to be the official inch of their land. And so from one region to the next, an inch is not the same size. Even today, there are countries that, that they, well, they don't use them anymore, but they still have the standard measurements on record. Those are not the same size as in the United States. So we have that inch. As we work our way up from an inch, what's the next largest unit of length that we know of? We have the foot is the one we typically use, right? How many inches are in a foot? 12 inches in a foot. Good. And a foot is yeah, literally the length from the tip of your big toe to the back of your heel. That's a foot. Now, again, King Edward declared his foot was going to be the official foot of the land. And him doing that made some of the other units that we used unnecessary. And let me explain why. If I wanted to measure the length and width of this room, using a foot would be a very good unit. If I wanted to measure the height of this wall over here, however, a foot would be a good unit to use. It's the right size. But I'd get up to about this height here, maybe with some serious stretching. But there's no way I'm getting all the way up to the top of that wall unless I... I don't know, chop my foot off or something. It's not going to work. I'm not getting my leg up there. The foot was only good for measuring distances along the ground because that's where your feet are. To measure heights like that, you actually used a unit called a hand, which was the distance across your hand at the, the base of the fingers here. That was about four inches. And actually, to this day, they use hands to measure the height of livestock. Sheep, cattle, horses, they'll measure their height in hands. Now, once King Edward declared his foot was going to be the official foot of the land, and now you had this piece of wood that you used, well, now you could use feet to measure the height of a wall because you didn't have to get your leg all the way up there. So hands became somewhat unnecessary. Like I said, tradition still uses them as for livestock and stuff like that. Now, King Edward's foot did not have 12 of his inches in it. Uh, a couple hundred years later, after King Edward was long gone, they adjusted those lengths so that there were 12 inches in a foot. They kind of decided, you know, if you measure something in feet and I measure something in inches, it'd be nice to be able to compare to see which one's bigger or smaller. Bigger than a foot, we have what unit of measure? Three feet is a yard. A yard, a lot of people think of a yard as being the length of a stride where you take one long step as being a yard. And it is about that long, but that's not where it came from. A yard actually comes from the end of your outstretched hand, either to the tip of your nose or the center of your chest. It's a tailor's unit. They use it for measuring fabric. They grab on the piece of fabric, they would pull it out, and that's one yard. Reach in, grab again, that's two yards, and so on. And again, King Edward declared his yard was the official yard. And again, it wasn't exactly three of his feet. They had to adjust the links later to make them fit. There's a unit between a foot and a yard that was used a lot called a cubit. Anybody ever heard of a cubit? A cubit was from the point of your middle finger or your longest finger to the, the point of your elbow. Now, most people are, are bigger now than they were back then, so it's a little bit longer. But at that time, a cubit was about 16 inches. Um, it was used mostly in construction. Think about it in construction. Your floor joists are usually 16 inches apart. 
uh, studs in the walls are 16 inches apart. Uh, it was a it was a common unit. That's what they used. They just used their arm to space them. Um, couldn't get their foot up there to do it, so it wasn't very practical to use their feet. Their arm was always right there to make it easy to space them out. So the cubit was a standard for construction. Well, again, once King Edward standardized the foot and the inch and the yard and stuff, the cubit fell by the wayside because now they developed um, rulers and, and measuring sticks and stuff like that. So they were able to use those then for measuring out stud spacings and joist spacings and stuff like that. Bigger than a yard, there are a lot of units out there, like a fathom um, is one we don't hear of anymore. It was for navigating. A fathom is approximately six feet. Um, what a fathom really was was the, the height of your tallest sailor on the ship. And it was the, the depth, the shallowest depth of water that most of your major vessels could navigate. So literally, they'd throw the sailor overboard, and if his head stuck out of the water, it was too shallow to, to get through. Now, hopefully they pulled them back in afterwards, just saying. But, yeah, that's that was a fathom. There is one in there that we're going to talk about called a rod. One rod is 5.5 or 5.5 yards or 16.5 or 16.5 feet. A rod was originally a shepherd's tool. It had a rod and a staff. Um, the staff was that that hook, you know, kind of like little Bo Peep has that little hook. It was for, you know, hooking the animals around the neck so you could shear the wool or, or tend to whatever needs, they, medical needs or whatever they had. Um, a rod was a defensive tool. It was a weapon. Wild animals threatened the flock. They would literally, they'd take this stick and, Chase away the animals with it. You think it's 16 and a half feet, that's about twice the height of this ceiling. That's a pretty big stick. You think, well, you're trying to chase off a wolf or something with nothing but a stick, you want a little bit of distance. Um, it literally was just a sapling tree they would cut down and debranch it, and that's what they would use for their rod. Now, how a rod became used for measurement. Let's say that I have some sheep, and Aaron has some sheep, and we send them down out to pasture. And they go down in the valley and they're intermingling. At the end of the day, I say, I had 20 sheep. Aaron says, well, I had 15 sheep. And there's only 25 sheep down there. Well, one or both of us is, is stretching the truth there a bit. So there's a lot of conflicts over that. Now, for cattle and horses, they settled those conflicts by branding. Well, branding did not work well for sheep for a couple of reasons. Um, one, their skin was a little too sensitive. It was hard to brand them without doing damage to them. Two, the wool grew out so thick you couldn't see the brand anyway, so it wasn't real visible. And three, and not unimportant, um, wool is kind of very flammable. Yeah, you can imagine that one in your head. So branding wasn't an option. They didn't have ear tags really readily available at that time. So marking the sheep wasn't an option. So this was actually the beginning of sectioning off land. They would take a, a big landmark, let's say there's a big tree there. They'd say, okay, um, we're going to measure this off. So I would take my rod, I'd lay it on the ground, there's one. Aaron would lay his end to end with it, that's two. I'd pick mine up, lay it down three. And we'd measure out the land. We might go 120 rods one way, 200 rods this way. That is... Aaron's land to pasture his sheep on. They do the same over here. That's my land to pasture my sheep on. So we'd measure up to make sure we had the same size pasture land or, or the appropriate size pasture land, put it that way. To this day, if you look at the legal description for land, land is still surveyed in rods. So that's the only reason I threw that one out there as one to remember. There are others in there like furlongs and stuff like that that we're not going to get into. But we will talk about the mile. Anybody remember how many feet are in a mile? 5,280 feet in one mile. How about yards? 1,760. 
Now, a mile, there's a lot of rumors out there about where a mile comes from. Um, one of them was that was the distance King Henry could see out the window from his throne room. Um, the best that I've seen as far as the most believable I've seen as far as the origin of the mile. Um, mile, the word mile comes from the, the Greek prefix mil. Mil means 1,000. Uh, if you look at your taxes, uh, property taxes, a mill rate is your price per thousand dollars worth of value. So a mile was the distance that, that Greek and Roman soldiers marched in formation for a thousand paces. Now a pace was starting on your left foot, going to your right foot, and then back to your left foot. So a thousand paces in formation was a mile. Now as I, as I mentioned, there were other units out there um, that have kind of slowly faded because we don't need them anymore because we have these standardized units. Most of us know how to convert from one unit to another. Uh, if we have 48 inches and we want to convert that into feet, what do we do? You just, you know, you divide by 12, right? If you're going from a small unit to a large unit, the number has the unit's getting larger, the number has to get smaller. But if you didn't know that, what you would do is this. 48 inches over 1. You make it a fraction. And then we use the units. We have an equivalency that says 12 inches equals 1 foot. So we want to get rid of inches. I'm going to put inches on bottom and feet on top. 12 inches equals 1 foot. What I am multiplying by here is 1. It's what we call a unity fraction. We use these unity fractions way back when we started doing fractions. If you recall, um, if I had 3 fourths and I multiplied by 5 over 5, I had 3 times 5 is 15. 4 times 5 is 20. It's 15 20 this is equivalent to 3 fourths. They have the same value. We changed the appearance, but we did not change the value because what we multiplied by here was a unity fraction. It equaled 1 because the numerator had the same value as the denominator. Over here, this one looks different, but it's still a unity fraction. 1 foot has the same value as 12 inches. So technically that does equal 1. So now if we go to use that, we're going to multiply. Well, the inches will cross cancel. 48 times 1 foot is 48 feet. 1 times 12 is 12. 48 feet divided by 12 is 4 feet. So 48 inches is 4 feet. Now... That one you may have been able to do in your head because a lot of us have worked with inches and feet quite a bit in our life. So let's say I have 96 feet. Actually, let me, 90, 99 feet, I believe, is what I need to have. And I want to convert it into rods. First, I need to find an equivalency between feet and rods. One rod is how many feet? Sixteen point five, sixteen and a half. So now we can start out with our ninety-nine feet. I'm going to make it a fraction by putting it over one. Now over here, where does feet go, top or bottom? Well, they're already on top, so we need to put them on. Bottom. So that means rods has to go on top. And the equivalency is one rod, 16.5 feet. So the feet cancel out. So 99 times one rod is 99 rods. One times 16.5 is 16.5. 99 rods divided by 16.5 is six rods. So 99 feet is equal to six rods. Or we might have four rods, 
We're getting converted into yards. So you got four rods over one. Let's just think about units for a minute, no numbers. What unit has to go on the bottom in my conversion factor here? Rods, because rods are over here. I need to put them on bottom so they'll cancel out. And I'm converting two yards. And the relationship now is one rod is 5.5 yards. So the rods cancel out. Four times 5.5 yards is 22 yards. One times one is one. 22 yards divided by one is just 22 yards. So four rods is 22 yards. Make sense? No? A little? Okay. Basically, as long as we know the relationship between the two units, we can use the rules of fractions to make that conversion. Um, for example, let's say we have 7 yards, and I want to convert it into feet. The relationship I have there is that 1 yard equals 3 feet. So I'm going to start out with that measurement I'm given, the 7 yards. And I'm just going to make it a fraction by putting it over 1. Now to convert, whatever unit I started out with that I want to get rid of has to go on bottom here so that they'll cancel out. So the yards go on bottom. Well, I'm dealing with yards and feet, so that means feet have to go on top. My relationship is one yard equals three feet. So here's the yard. So one yard equals three feet. So now the yards will cancel out because there's yards on top and yards on bottom. They cancel out. Then we multiply 7 times 3 feet is 21 feet. 1 times 1 is 1. Now dividing by 1, I don't even really have to do it, but 21 feet divided by 1 is just 21 feet. So 7 yards is 21 feet. Let's talk about weight. Before we talk about weight, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between weight and mass. Because there actually are some important differences between them. We tend to use them interchangeably, although we shouldn't. Weight is a measurement of the force of gravity on an object. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. So how, in other words, how much stuff, how many particles, how, how many atoms are in an object is the mass. So let's look at how they're measured. The way we measure weight is generally against a spring. In a spring, the more you stretch the spring, the more force it takes. In fact, it's usually uniform. On a good spring, if you double the, the distance you stretch it, you double the amount of force it takes. So let's say this is its standard length. We stretch it that far, and it takes five pounds. Let's say now we stretch it that far, which is twice as far. That takes 10 pounds of force to stretch it that far. And because of that predictable behavior of that spring, we can use a spring to create a scale. So what we'll do is we'll take that spring and we, we mount it with a scale. There's an indicator on it. So when there's no weight on it, that's zero. Then we hang our, our object on it that we're trying to measure. And it stretches it 
The distance it stretches indicates the weight of the object. And so it's marked on here with a scale. That's why it's called a scale. It's a numbered scale on there. So we can look at how far that spring stretches to see what the weight of that object is. Mass is measured with a balance. So this is called a scale. Over here, this is going to be called a balance. A balance basically looks like a teeter-totter or seesaw. We put the object we're trying to measure on one side. Then we put known masses on the other side. Until it balances. When it balances, whatever the amount of mass is we put on this side, that's equal to the mass over here. So that's how we measure mass. So the question is, what does it matter? Why is there a difference? Well, if we go to the moon, where gravity is one-sixth what it is on Earth, what's going to happen to the amount that gravity pulls on this object here? It's going to be less, right? That's going to be one-sixth. So that marker is only going to move that far. That's now going to be the weight of our object, that little distance. So the weight is going to change. Over here, the amount that gravity pulls on this object is going to be less, isn't it? But the amount that gravity pulls on our known masses is also going to be less. So the mass does not change. So that's the big thing is mass does not depend on gravity. Mass is a, mass is a constant. Weight changes depending on the gravity that it's under. So now let's get down to the practical side of this. On Earth, gravity is relatively constant. Now I intentionally drew that, not round. Gravity is the smallest at the equator. The least gravity at the, the equator. And the most gravity at the north and south poles. Now, on a 200-pound person, it would only be enough to make a difference of about 3 or 4 pounds. But there is a gravity difference. So gravity is relatively close to the same everywhere on Earth. Because it's relatively close to the same, you can use gravity and mass kind of interchangeably. Because if gravity stays the same, well, then there's a, a direct relationship between your weight and your mass. If your, your gravity changes, then that relationship between your weight and your mass is going to change. So since on Earth, gravity is relatively constant, we are going to, we tend to get sloppy between mass and weight. And the standard system there is a unit of mass, although most people have never heard of it. It's called a slug. One slug has a weight of about 32 pounds. Um, you may, but you probably have heard this term in some of our figures of speech. But you might ask, well, how much did you eat while well, I ate a whole slug of whatever? Or you had a whole slug of, of this item? Never heard that expression? All right. Well, that's where it comes from, is a slug is a unit of mass. We're never going to be quizzed or tested on that. We're not going to deal with slugs in this class. We're going to focus on standard weight. We're going to start out on the larger units and work our way down. One of the larger units we use is a ton. One ton is how big? 2,000 pounds we think of as a ton. And it is. That's actually what we call one net or short ton. 2,000 pounds. If there's a net or a short ton, that implies that there is something called a gross or a long ton. 
And there is. A long ton or a gross ton is 2,240 pounds. Why is there a difference? Well, think in terms of your paycheck. If you work 40 hours a week and you're getting paid $12 an hour, that's 480 bucks. Do you actually get $480 at the end of the week? No, they take out taxes and other stuff. That $480 is your gross. That's the whole thing. But you might actually get a check for $370. That's your net. That's how much you actually get. Gross ton and net ton come from the same thing. The ton was originally used for buying and selling grain. And when you used a scale for measuring grain, you couldn't just put a stack of grain on there. It kind of fell off the edges, right? So they had to put it in a container. Well, the container that held one ton of grain weighed about 240 pounds. So a gross ton was the weight of the grain with the container. The short ton was the weight of the grain by itself without the container. 99.99999% of the time when you hear the word ton, they are talking about a net ton or a short ton. In this class, anytime you hear the word ton, we're talking about 2,000 pounds. So we will not use the gross ton in this class. So now a pound, first of all, the abbreviation for pound is LB. And it would make sense to use PD for pound. However, in the bookkeeping system for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. So they didn't want to confuse pound with paid. So they used the Latin word for pound, which is Libra, and they used LB as the abbreviation. What's that? I think that's where I was going next. So how many, that's the next smallest unit is? The ounce, how many ounces are in a pound? 16 ounces, yeah. The abbreviation for ounce is OZ. That also comes from the Latin word for ounce, which I cannot remember right now. But it comes out to OZ. It doesn't matter. So anyway, there is a unit smaller than an ounce that most people don't know about. It is called a... Dram, it sounds metric, but it is not. One ounce has 16 drams in it. You've heard of that before? Have you ever seen old movies or old uh, TV shows? Um, they'll talk about medications. That was an apothecary. You might be prescribed an eighth of a dram of a medication. There are smaller units. There's minims. Um, that we're not going to talk about minims. Grains is in there. One pound contains 7,000 grains. This is also a medical unit, a grain. You know, you think of like a, a single little grain of salt, literally, they call it a grain. Uh, you count them out, that's a grain. So for medications, they'd often take these granular medications and count them out. You know, you need the, the medication to be 100 grains of this medication, so they'd actually count out with the tweezers and a little magnifying glass, 100 grains. Yeah, they had a lot more free time back then than they do now. But the grain actually is so embedded in medical terminology that they actually adopted it into the metric system for medical measurements. Trying to remember a minimum, I believe there are 60 minims in a dram. So I don't have it written down here. But. So those are our conversion are our measurements for weight. And the conversions work just like our conversions for, for length. If I have something that is 11 ounces and I want to know how many drams it's going to be. Careful. 
Make my 11 ounces over one. I'll put ounces on bottom, drams on top. One ounce is 16 drams. So the ounces cross cancel. 11 times 16 is 176 grams. One times one is one. So that is just 176. There you go. So 176 grams and 11 ounces. You hear a lot about in the last few years on the radio or financial reports, gold has hit $1,800 an ounce or whatever. I want you to be aware that they are not talking about these ounces. As I had mentioned earlier, different rulers, different leaders at different times and different locations declared their thumb was going to be the official inch and their foot, the official foot and so on. And that happened with all of our types of units of weight. So each region had pounds that were different sizes and ounces that were different sizes. Well, the center in the world for buying and selling precious metals was in the Mediterranean Sea and it was on the island of Troy. So precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, and others are bought and sold using Troy measure. In the Troy measuring system, one Troy pound is about 0.82 of our regular pounds. But one Troy pound contains only 12 Troy ounces. So even though a Troy pound is slightly smaller than a regular pound, a Troy ounce is actually slightly larger than a regular ounce. So when you hear that on the, the news or financial reports, keep that in mind. You'll never be tested on Troy measurements, by the way. I just wanted to throw those out there just so you knew there are other ones out there. Okay, our next step I want to talk about capacity. And to talk about capacity, just like with weight and mass, I've got to talk about the difference between capacity and volume. Volume is found as a combination of length measurements. If I have a box that is 12 inches by 8 inches by 5 inches, its volume, 12 inches times 8 inches times 5 inches, is 480 inches cubed. That's a volume. Like I said, it is found by multiplying length measurements. So it's literally the cube of a length measurement is a volume. Capacity is a standard container. Now these words get interchanged a lot, and this is one that I end up screwing up quite a bit. There's a difference between capacity and volume. I, I use volume a lot of times when I should say capacity. But when we're looking at capacity, our main unit of capacity that it's used is a gallon. A gallon was actually the size of a standard man's hat. Now we're not talking about you know, a cowboy hat. Or we're talking about the little derby dress hats that a lot of men wore in Europe. That was a gallon hat. Have you heard the term 10 gallon hat? Well, that didn't mean that that hat held 10 gallons. It was just a figure of speech. A 10-gallon hat was what they, when they first started seeing cowboy hats, it was a little bit of a surprise to them. Um, so you referred to, oh, that's a 10-gallon hat right there. In other words, it's a big, fancy hat. doesn't really mean it holds 10 gallons. Smaller than a gallon. One gallon, what's the next smaller unit? Next one we use is quartz. 
Anybody know how many quarts are in a gallon? Four. The word quart actually comes from the word quarter. So a quarter of a gallon or four quarts in a gallon, one fourth of a gallon. Smaller than a quart, we have pints. There are two pints in a quart. A pint was actually a standard size container. Um, it was a jar used for canning. And it was also a jar or a container used for selling beer. So you might have someone walk into a, a barn or give me a pint or whatever, a pint of whiskey, pint of beer, whatever. A pint was a drink, standard drink size. Now smaller than a pint. By the way, a little bit of a word of warning. Quart is abbreviated QT, pint is PT. Depending on your type fonts, you know, Q, sometimes QT looks like that. PT looks like that. In some type fonts, Qs and Ps are just mirror images of each other. If you have any dyslexic tendencies like I do, can be really easy to mix those two up. So be careful with them. Smaller than a pint, we have a, a cup. And a cup was actually your standard drinking glass. Um, it's not where a cup actually came from, however. A cup actually is the cup hand. It started out as dry measurement. So if you dump flour or sugar in your hand and let it heap up, the amount of flour or sugar you could hold in that cupped hand was one cup. So a cup was originally dry measurement, whereas a gallon, quart, and pints were all liquid measurements. Once we started to standardize them, of course, now either one can be used for dry or, or liquid. One pint contains two cups. This was also adjusted slightly to make them fit. If you try it once, I've got a friend of mine who's a caterer, and when you know her recipes call for cups, she just uses her hand, and I've checked her a couple times, she's dead on with the, just putting it in the palm of her hand for getting a cup. Smaller than a cup, we have fluid ounces. Anybody know how many fluid ounces are in a cup? There's eight of them. Eight fluid ounces in a cup. A fluid ounce is defined to be the weight of, well, sorry, the volume, the, the capacity that is required to hold one ounce of water, one weight ounce of water. That size is a fluid ounce. That has been slightly adjusted through the years, so it's not quite dead on. You needed to adjust it to make it fit in with the cup. But it is really, really close to one weight ounce of water. There are units smaller than a fluid ounce. Smaller than a fluid ounce, we have a tablespoon. Anybody know how many tablespoons are in a fluid ounce? There are two tablespoons in one fluid ounce. There's 16 tablespoons in a cup. Smaller than a tablespoon, we have a teaspoon. Teaspoons in a tablespoon? Three. Another word of warning here. The abbreviation for tablespoon. I was always taught TBSP for tablespoon or capital TBSP. That's what I use in this class just to exaggerate it. But other acceptable abbreviations for tablespoon are just a capital T or capital TSP. The reason that's such a big deal is abbreviations for teaspoon or a small TSP or just a small T. So you can see here the similarities between the abbreviations, the only difference is a capital T versus a small T. 
When I abbreviate tablespoon, I'll use TBSP, use your capital TBSP, just to exaggerate it. But you can see there is a pretty tight link there between them. And trust me, if a cookie recipe calls for three teaspoons of salt, and you put in three tablespoons, there's no amount of milk that's going to make them go down. If you look at me closely, you can understand this body has not turned down too many cookies in my life. But, yeah, it's not, not good. Not a good, it's a mistake you only make once. Put it down. Smaller than a teaspoon, and you do not need to write these down because I'll never test you on them. I throw these units out here just for fun. Smaller than a teaspoon. One teaspoon contains two dashes. Yep. A dash actually comes from like the big salt shaker. You know, what, we, what we're used to seeing for salt shakers is not a standard shaker. They actually have spice shakers that are big. They're like the size of a coffee mug with bigger holes in them. And a dash was just one tip, one shake of it, one dash of it. Um, so that was actually, you know, a dash of spice was where you take the shaker and you go one dash of the spice. Smaller than a dash. One dash contains three pinches. A pinch, you just stuck your fingers in there and you pinched on and threw it in. Whatever was between your fingers is what went into the recipe. One pinch equals two smidgens. Now the smidgen is one that kind of grosses me out a little bit. The smidgen you just stuck your finger in and whatever stuck to your finger you, you wiped off in the recipe. So the, the cook with really sweaty fingers had big smidgens. Yeah. that's I try not to think about that one too much. Bigger then gallons, we have other units. You might have a peck. It's two gallons. You heard the old uh, tongue twister Peter Piper picked a peck of pi pickled peppers. Um, that's what a peck is. Uh, the, mo the time you'd see that most around here is if you go buy strawberries, the strawberry patch. They have the one peck and two peck containers, those little cardboard containers that they sell them in, that's pecks. One peck is two gallons, basically. A bushel is eight gallons or four pecks. There's actually, yeah. They just throw those words out there and they don't define them in a lot of cases. A barrel. Anybody know how much is in a barrel? How many gallons in a barrel? A lot of people say 55 gallons. 55 gallons is a drum. One barrel is 31.5 gallons. So a barrel of oil is 31.5 gallons of oil. Um, a quarter barrel of beer is one-fourth of that. So it's seven point it's seven and seven eighths is what it comes out to be. So those are our volumes, or our capacities, I should say. There is a relationship between capacity and volume. One gallon, and now notice I'm not putting an equal sign, I'm kind of curving the lines, because it's not exact. One gallon is approximately 231 cubic inches. So if you need to make that conversion between them, it is there. And then, of course, a cubic foot. What do you think is bigger, a cubic foot or a gallon? A gallon you think is bigger? They're about equal. A lot of people think that, but a cubic foot, think about this, a five-gallon bucket. Is, do you think a five-gallon bucket is bigger or smaller than a cubic foot? Most people, because it's taller, think it's, it's bigger than a cubic foot. It's actually smaller. One cubic foot, depending on what you're looking at, is 7.5 or 7.48 gallons. So a cubic foot is considerably larger than a gallon. 
Okay, it's time for our break, so let's go ahead and take our break.